welcome to our conversation with uh, Professor Coco Auerswald. Um, this has been part of the Collective Awakening course, which is about uh, Thich Nhat Hanh's vision for mindfulness in public health. So uh, we've been uh, cooking up some dialogues in the coming Sundays, and this is the first one to kick off the series. Um, so it's all kind of a new format, and we'll see how it goes. But we're really, really very grateful that uh, Professor Ioswold, and uh, may I don't pronounce it correctly, I'm sorry. No big deal. No one, no, no one thinks of me as Professor Ioswold. It's just <laughs> Dr. Coco <laughs> or Coco. Uh, and so um, known to her, many of us as Coco. So uh, she's been coming to uh, Deer Park for a number of years. She's been practicing in the Plum Village tradition since 2015 and a student of mindfulness and meditation since 2010. And uh, she's an MD and an MS, a, pedi a pediatrician who specializes in adolescent medicine, as well as being a professor at the University of California, Berkeley School of Public Health. Yeah, she's focusing on uh, the social determinants of well-being among youth experiencing historical marginalization. And that's been her work for the last 25 years. So we're so happy to have her here and have all of you joining in and watching along with this dialogue. And we'll, it'll be about um, maybe about 40 or 50 minutes. And hopefully, uh, if uh, Coco is OK, we might have some time for questions towards the end. Please. OK, so just to get started, I am curious, what, what for you is uh, the practice of being a public health advocate or professor of public health? Um, well, that's a big question. <laughs> I would say it really depends on the person, of course. And so since you're saying for me, um, I mean, public health is the focus on the health of populations. So I'm also a physician. And as a physician, you have a more one-on-one, -on -one, what we would might call a dyadic relationship, a relationship between two people trying to improve someone's health. In the case of public health, we're trying to improve the health of populations. And so when we're looking at the health of populations, we're thinking about, you know, what what affects the health of populations. And for me, I'm particularly interested in the population of adolescents and young adults. And the reason I cared about that population is that basically we shouldn't need public health for adolescents and young adults. Mm -hmm. They should all just be super duper healthy. They've made it out of the sort of the dangerous phases of early childhood. And they have shown themselves to be hardy and they shouldn't need public health interventions mm -hmm. or really even physicians. But it turns out that the health of young people is determined by their environment. It's determined by factors that are beyond their control. Even though we have a very ageist society, particularly against young people, not as much as, you know, more to, in my mind than with elders. And so um, we see those negative effects as being the fault of young people, where in fact, it is a result of factors that are beyond their control and often factors that took place before they were born or maybe even before their parents were born. And so I see my mission as someone who addresses public health as someone who uh, who tries to really unpack, really understand the ways in which factors uh, historically and from a societal perspective, from a community perspective, and then from relationships perspective, all how all those things affect the health of young people, and then what we can do to change it without mm. blaming young people for their poor health. Mm. So that's my mission in public health. And uh, yeah, happy to talk about that or anything else. Yeah. And Tyso often talked about not blaming the lettuce, right? If the lettuce is wilted, we don't blame the lettuce. We look yeah. at what are the conditions that brought about the, the weakness and the integrity yeah. of the, the, the seeds, of the growth of the leaves. 
right? We tried to see, well, what are the conditions in terms of sun and the rain and the earth that brought about that, that uh, wilting of the lettuce, right? But we don't ever think to blame the lettuce. And yet somehow there is this kind of um, collective perception that when someone is unhealthy, that they've done something wrong. Absolutely. I, I think that's really, I have to see that, um, that piece about the lettuce, uh, Brother Faplu. I hope you can share that with me because actually there is a fable of the gardener by a really famous public health practitioner. And of course, now I'm not remembering her name, but she's <laughs> really very important in terms of understanding public health and uh, its role in addressing racism. And so certainly people of color, we blame for their poor health, often blame them on, you know, having um, behaviors that led to their poor health. And we, instead of understanding the ways in which um, historical factors, racism, disinvestment, uh, criminalization, and interpersonal racism, as well as internalized racism, all those things affect the water, the soil, um, the pot, um, everything that's happening to the plant that is that person. And then we look and we say, well, gee, those plants aren't as hardy. There must be a problem. Mm. Uh, and blame blame the plants or blame the lettuce or blame yeah. the humans. So actually, that's a, that's a public health metaphor as well. Mm. So I've been really struck uh, in reflecting it on Thai teachings at how much Thai was concerned about the well-being of for example, the villagers in, mm -hmm. in the south of Vietnam, especially at that time, not only in the south, but also in the center uh, during the war time in Vietnam, and how he, I mean, he, he chose a path. Of course, he was eventually going to the West and speaking out to for the, on, on behalf of the people, but I'm always struck at how he, instead of overtly coming out and trying to um at first uh change the politics behind the war he mobilized young people mm -hmm. gave them a training mindfulness training and and helped them you know go out and just you know really with no money just their good intentions to help and uh, improve the, the the public health situation of these villages right. in terms of education, in terms of medicine, in terms of sanitation, everything, everything that he could learn from the Peace Corps or whatever, you know, organizations were doing that work, at, developmental work at that time, Tai was bringing it in. And then what well, you ended up with, with all these young people, some of them are still in the Sangha today, you know, part of the the School of Youth for Social Service, right? who are now this lifetime mindfulness fun. practitioners and public health advocates. Um, and, and yeah, 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 it's really inspiring in a way. Um, you know, I feel we can speak out a, about situations but to actually get our, our hands in there to actually go on you know in the monastery the monastics we do it mainly through um teaching and um meeting with people with trauma who come up or social workers who come up to the monastery uh, i wonder how you see your engagement um, both as a teacher but also like as a pediatrician working with kids you know how, how do you see maintaining that balance as well because that was the thing that Tai, that's how Tai wrote the miracle of mindfulness, right? As a manual for his, the workers in the School of Youth for Social Service, how to take care of themselves. So, I, and, and knowing that taking care of themselves will also transform their way of serving and transforming the situation of the collective. Um, well, thank you for asking that. I think, um, I think that's really evolved for me, how I do that. Um, and now that I read um, Tai's teachings and uh, and his interpretations of what the Buddha said, um, I'm actually pretty blown away by how both of them uh, really are public health 
philosophers and how science now is showing um, in very, very deep and revolutionary ways how right they were and are mm -hmm. uh, about their insights. And um, so anyway, yeah, I'm jumping around <laughs> a little. I think uh, but for me, that's really helped me in this work, seeing that. So I um, I think that uh, initially, if I think about my work in light of Tai's teachings, um, I think about listening to young people and how important that has been for me is just listening to people and um, being a mindful listener an intentional listener to people's stories. And that's really how I started this work. And that was way before I started practicing mindfulness. But I realize now that um, that was a skill that I brought to this work, mm -hmm. hopefully a skill that I was also bringing clinically. But it was different than in the clinical setting where I had to put people's stories into boxes. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first started spending time on the street with young people experiencing homelessness, which, as you know, is um, the main focus of my work, although not the only focus of my work. Um, at first, I tried to put them into boxes, too, because I wanted them to fit a certain story. Um, and then I found that, um, like Ty says, that if you just let people talk, about what they need to talk about and talk about their trauma and talk about their story. It um, can be so healing and you can also get to, you know, some version of truth, mm -hmm. um, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. And so that insight, those insights I got from those conversations really helped me understand uh, before I was a public health practitioner, the degree to which uh, young people were uh, trying to be resilient in the face of factors beyond their control. Mm -hmm. And also the degree to which um, my relationship with them as a researcher could, could be healing if mm -hmm. I we had that mutual respect. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, this is work I started when my now almost 26 year old daughter was just a few months old. And mm -hmm. uh, so I would just give people, you know, $5 for spending a little time with me. And some young people refused uh, hmm. the money. It was really interesting. And I felt guilty because I was keeping them away from what they called spanging or, you know, panhandling. Um, I felt guilty <laughs> taking their time. I was like, no, take the money. It's okay. And they'd say, no, this helped me so much. I don't want you to pay me. I just want you to share, share my story. Um mm -hmm. Hmm. So um, anyway, that's, I think, one piece for me. Um, I think the other part, you know, sort of fast forward a long period of time, I started understanding more how, um, how inequity gets into the body. And so when you asked earlier about what our role is as public health practitioners, I think that you know, when I first started, or even before I started, a lot of public health was about sort of shushing people about their behaviors. So, you know, don't smoke and uh, don't eat high cholesterol foods, and you should exercise more and you should do these things, and then you'll have clean arteries and you won't have a heart attack. I mean, that was just like, you know, the public health success story. Mm -hmm. um, but it really turned out that that actually really doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, lecturing people, including I'm sure everyone on this call, you know, we've been lectured to do things we we don't do. And so changing people's environment um, is a lot more important and not blaming people is a lot more important. And understanding what we call the social determinants of health is a lot more important. Um, and understanding that a lot of times people's poor health actually has nothing to do with their behavior. Mm -hmm. And so um, there's actually a really famous researcher, uh, Michael Marmot, who's now Sir Michael Marmot, who studied this with uh, British public servants. It's a really cool study. 
hmm. because we figure that people are have poor health if they're poor, right? Hmm. And because they don't have enough food or they don't have a place to live or things like that. And then as they get more, they'll be okay. But then once you have everything you need, you know, basically it shouldn't really matter that much. Your health shouldn't just keep going up at the same rate. Hmm. And so really poor health, or health should improve as you meet your needs and then maybe a little more. And then it really should level off hmm. because, you know, you're getting what you need. But what he found when he looked at British social servants and he looked at the lowest rung person all the way to the prime minister was that health improved at every step. Hmm. And it wasn't just due to people having their needs and what and then they found this over and over this study has been reproduced over and over in multiple societies and it turns out that there's a lot more to it and a lot of it has to do with uh how people internalize social status hmm. and so um Class, something we don't like yeah, to talk well, about class, in, in the U.S. <laughs> yeah, class, which supposedly, right, doesn't exist here. Uh, <laughs> um, and um, now I've like, I've got <laughs> on a story. Sorry, I didn't mean off to on a story. <laughs> pick you off. Yeah. But no, yes. Yeah, so anyway, so when he discovered that, then people were trying to figure out, well, how the hell does that happen? Mm. You know, and um, because it didn't really make sense. And so then they figured, oh, well, poor people have bad behaviors and rich people have good behaviors, but that's also not true. Mm -hmm. It turns out that's not true at all. Mm -hmm. And that people with the same behaviors are going to have poorer health when they have less social status. And so it turns out that, that inequality and uh, things like racism uh, poverty, relatively lower social status, especially extreme social status, trauma, all these things actually directly affect your health, regardless of your behavior. So your behavior can be exactly the same. But if you undergo certain kinds of experiences of inequity, uh, such as racism, or trauma or abuse as a child, your body actually gets wear and tear from that. Mm -hmm. um, it actually experiences harm from that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something we call allostatic load, but really allostatic load is just wear and tear. Mm -hmm. And we see that in people, like it sounds like, oh, wow, that's kind of a dramatic thing. But actually when you, sometimes you see people who've had a really hard life and they look older than they should, you mm -hmm. go like, wow, I can't believe they're 40. They look like they're 60. Yeah. You know, and that's the allostatic load. And so I really, my work has become more and more about how inequity affects allostatic load in young people mm -hmm. and how we as a society can change that. Mm -hmm. And so I've become interested in things like what happens when we house young people who've been homeless, mm -hmm. um, you know, what happens in that situation. And I'm also very interested in mindfulness for young people um, who've been severely traumatized for the same reason. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So anyway, yeah, I, much more and more to say about that. But but to me, I think that's been kind of an arc, all of which, it, and the allostatic load has a lot to do with uh, interbeing and how really it's another form or the social determinants of health and how allostatic load it gets uh, loaded onto people has a lot to do with interbeing and how harm mm -hmm. to the community um, or harm or karma out there. You know, you could think of racism as karma that's put out there that is harmful to people. And you mm -hmm. realize the degree to which it's true what, what Ty says that e words harm people even if they're just said out there, that mm -hmm. actually it's going to come and physically harm somebody, even mm -hmm. age them more. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you mentioned intervening because I, I wanted to ask you know, how you see the, you know, the intersection of your spiritual practice mm -hmm. um, with the public health advocacy. I mean, how how can for you personally, but also for for all of us, like I mean, these are 
issues that I think everyone on this call feels passionately about transforming in here in the US or whether it's in Brazil or wherever it might be, right? In Europe, in, in, in Africa, in Asia. And these are situations of inequality and hierarchy um, that have existed for centuries. And here, here we are at this junction where, you know, people who are relative of history were many, a, a, a mass kind of body of people who are in uh, fairly well off, they're well off enough to, um, you know, have relatively good health, live longer lives. They, they want to change the situation and are trying to change it at the policy level. But yet, when we observe the past 20 years, inequality is still going up. And yeah. Racism, which some some uh, in the U.S., I've heard older folks say, uh, "Oh, we thought in the '60s that we with civil rights, we, you know, by now racism would be something of the past, and yet it's been almost the opposite. Yeah, and it's been even more um, prone to polarize uh, people's views. So, so how how do we restore that dignity that allows good health?" to manifest in all people with a spiritual practice? I mean, how does that contribute to it? I mean, we can talk about interbeing, but how do we put it into practice? Right. How do we put it into practice? Um, there's so many levels to that. Um, I keep saying that, but it's true. These are, these are, I tend to think of things in ecosystems. And so I'm thinking about how I answer that question at the individual level, at the interpersonal mm -hmm. level, at the community level, at the social level, and really at the historical level. And so I feel like there's different answers depending on what level you think about. Um, but focusing directly on people who have been harmed by historical trauma, intergenerational trauma, and continued trauma towards them, um, and I'll focus specifically on young people who experience homelessness because those are the conversations I've had. Um, it's interesting. I was even talking to someone who will remain unnamed, <laughs> who uh, does research regarding mindfulness, uh, not connected to this practice, but has done quite a bit of research in this area. And when I talked to this person about doing the practice with uh youth who have experienced homelessness, um, it was completely dismissed as just absolute folly um, because first of all, they wouldn't be able to engage. And second of all, you know, they just needed housing and, you know, it's silly to think about meditating with them. Uh, and, uh, yeah, basically started kind of mansplaining all of that. <laughs> and uh, it was very interesting. <laughs> At first I was really disheartened. And then I, you know, I decided, well, first of all, I hadn't really explained myself well, maybe. And then another, you know, there's so much stigma, right? So um, I think, I think this idea that that certain populations, you know, can't benefit from mindfulness is uh, is very uh, elitist, um, and and also is based on kind of an either or mentality. You know, I think he was having an either or mentality, and other people have said that to me, like, oh, Coco, you know, you can't just do mindfulness with them; you have to get them a place to live, and it's just like, duh, person <laughs> need a place to live. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just like it's it's like okay either they have a place to live or they get to meditate you know it's just like it's so ridiculous and mm -hmm. and so you know young people have a human right to shelter um but the fact that we have this sort of housing first philosophy etc i think with regard to well-being has meant that people just think about only housing you know, it's really housing first has turned into only housing. And so we talk a lot about how people experiencing homelessness need housing, but we don't talk about all the other things that that they need, like inclusion, like love, um, and like access to 
ways that they can care for their trauma in mm. ways that are not harmful. Mm. Um, so people experiencing homelessness because they are excluded often have to self-medicate in order to survive. And I most certainly would be self-medicating if I lived in Golden Gate Park. There is absolutely no doubt about it. I used to be a heavy smoker and I'm sure I would turn to substances to survive in that environment if I had to. Mm -hmm. But why not give people tools where they can take care of themselves and heal from their trauma in addition to giving them housing and food and basic needs. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I think people who have been excluded, and, and I, I know you know this as someone who is focused on sharing this practice with others, that, you know, it is, it's been a challenge even for folks who care about this to share this practice with people who aren't as privileged. Mm -hmm. And also, frankly, with people who are young. Mm -hmm. um, it, I, I found it difficult as a mother, as a practitioner, as a, as a physician for adolescents, and also as someone who wants to support severely traumatized young people, I have found it very difficult to access uh, this practice for, for young people and for marginalized folks. Mm -hmm. And I think if we could, it would make a world of difference. Mm -hmm. Does that, is that instead of fighting for justice, of course not. And I think that's a discussion that comes up all the time. Hmm. Of course not. But I think uh, I think it's very important to help people with their second arrows, you know, to help people not further harm themselves when the world has harmed them so much. And not that I'm blaming their trauma on them in any way, but how can we help people be feel love for themselves and care for themselves and be able to interact with others in ways that are um, self-loving and loving of others? And how can they feel peace, you mm. know, just peace? Mm. Um, and so I think that, that that's, that's, that's extremely important. And so um, there are public health and uh, there are public health paradigms to describe that hmm. um but uh fundamentally um that that's that's how i like to think about it um as a way as a way to complement uh the need for social justice hmm. Hmm. and also as a form of equity hmm. yeah we have so many young people here now at the monastery at deer park saying yeah. three-month range retreat and so many who are engaged in wanting to you know, yeah not we'll do what Tai told me one time is not separate or try to find some uh, like um, equilibrium between engaged practice and contemplative practice mm -hmm. <laughs> but that they are one they were never mm -hmm. separated so talking about balancing them is not yeah does it make sense in fact when i yeah. when i came here to deer park in 2006 I, I told me that when i came here and i from that moment it just it, it's like it collapsed in my head i, I know no longer dwell on thinking like okay i you know now i need more contemplative part and right now it's engaged and if you see tight life that is the, the proof in the pudding right <laughs> right i mean tight tight is engaged i mean interbeing for me means that whether we're sitting in the monastery, whether we're out on the street, you know, if I'm riding uh, a bike down in Escondido here and, you know, in the bike lane and I'm, you know, the other day I was talking to a, a guy who was uh, in front of this, we were putting up signs for a Spanish speaking retreat mm -hmm. and you know, one man experiencing homelessness came up to me and said, can, you know, can I come up to the monastery? <laughs> and, and, he didn't he 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 said I'll, I'll i'll he wasn't sure if he could stop using drugs for the time that he was at the monastery yeah and so i you know just shared some things about what we do like mindful breathing mindful walking and i see that more and more the the young monks here uh they want to have that kind of engagement so yeah you know, i i'm i'm looking into how can 
how can we as practitioners and as people concerned about public health um, really be effective in creating this new kind of way of, of being in society where um, we don't rely on a social organization or um, the government or uh, yeah exactly like a program to provide housing um, to to kind of deal with the situation but actually um, meet each situation where it's at you know where we when we meet somebody in the street where we um, I mean here where we're even some of us are talking about creating a something like Thai School of Youth for Social Service where young yeah. people could stay in the monastery and do go out and do some kind of service in the world um, but it's new it's all you know maybe it's just that the conditions are sufficient now <laughs> for, for that kind of stability in our community to do that um, I hope they are um, but it's it's something that you know I I, I feel that is uh, yeah somehow the direction that Thai gave to us is Thai's vision right not just to sit in the monastery so you know I wonder if you have any words of um, wisdom or, or support for, for us in the monastery and just for young people in general? Well, um, I work with young people more than I work with people my age. And I am so happy about that <laughs> uh, uh, because, uh, because I, it gives me hope. Um, and so, um, and I think it's critical, uh, I mean, it's critical in my work to be sure that I'm engaging young people from communities that are affected by these forces of it, that lead to inequity, that I'm, I'm being very intentional about providing a pipeline through my mentorship to help them be effective in public health. And so I think um, as the community thinks about doing this work, thinking about, um, you know, how to be sure that uh, we're being inclusive of young people who have lived experiences of the of the uh, types of trauma we're trying to address is really, 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 really important. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it's also uh, the practice is uh, is also very important, and I found it. So I, I, I actually practice mindfulness in in class with my students. I start every class with a meditation, and uh, and I actually brought Joanne Rosen to my class. Uh, you know, as you know, a really important uh, Dharma teacher and yeah. tradition. And uh, I heard her speak when we had our mindful or the Buddhist psychology retreat. And I knew her already, but I hadn't seen her give that talk. And I begged her to come <laughs> to speak to my students to talk about how mindfulness can help with trauma, but also uh, how it can help with secondary trauma. Um, so uh, that's another thing that I think is really important for young people doing this work, because um, especially I think as young people it can be really painful to see uh, see so much harm being inflicted on folks. Mm. Uh, and it can be hard not to not to be able to just change it right now. Right. It's very difficult. And so uh, I have found that uh, having a that having a mindful practice of mindfulness practice can help a lot to support uh, to support young people doing this work. So I would say it's both sharing the practice, um, being sure that you're including folks in the community that represent the the community you want to serve, and also taking care of uh, secondary trauma. All those things are are really important. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think there's a huge role that Plum Village can play in this work. Mm -hmm. I think we're really at a uh, at a point where we we really need a paradigm change in how we're addressing all uh, you know the internalized harm that people are experiencing from uh, from social inequality. And there's such a critical role for this practice. 
and and it's not just because of my own experience it's also just like it's been scientifically shown i mean this isn't like right. mumbo jumbo this is like a scientifically proven intervention that really helps people uh, with their mental health and their physical health, mm -hmm. uh, with all the primary pathways that we know affect physical health and mental health, i.e. stress and inflammation. I mean, we know that this has an effect. And so, um, so plum, instead of having people try to simulate <laughs> that practice in laboratory settings or things like that, it would be so much better if folks could partner with Plum Village or with folks trained in the community to, um, to receive the practice and to, mm -hmm. so that they can help others improve their health. So mm -hmm. I think there, there is an enormous need mm -hmm for this. And this is, you know, certainly something I've talked about with my daughter, who, as you know, has studied, uh, has been part of this community for longer than I have. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's critically, critically important. Mm -hmm. I wonder, so we call this course a collective awakening ties vision for mindfulness and public health, mainly because I just saw so many correspondences between Tai's vision for talking about collective awakening. It's mm -hmm. Tai is very concrete. It's not just a, oh yeah, you know, wishful thinking, right? What is you know, collective awakening has to be real. It has to right. be something experienced. I mean, um, and with awakening, we often talk about happiness and well-being as well. Right. So it occurred to me, wow, public health is really <laughs> collective awakening, right? It's it's about how people concretely are well well off in their body and in their mind i wonder what you how you see um like i you know a practice that some people might consider to be more spiritual like mindfulness or or specifically plum village practice mm -hmm. how do you see it being it's integrated right. into into public health schools i mean public public health schools are um are institutions which in a way they're kind of evidence-based activist organizations right, right. research-based i mean we're, you're, you're training students to go into um the situations as policy makers perhaps in other countries where they'll go into being part of you know the government's uh, pu um, public health policy plan and and how can we do that how can we find the language to to bring these essential practices of interbeing into that kind of institution um, well, I think that very simple, simple first step is to bring it into the classroom and bring it into the laboratory. So, so I call my, my research group, my lab. So it's, you know, the, the students, primarily, uh, young people who have experienced homelessness or who are very deeply engaged in addressing, uh, um, the needs of people experiencing homelessness. So, um, in my in my class, but as well as in my research lab, we we uh, meditate as part of that practice, and um, or do mindful walking sometimes, but primarily a short guided sit. And it's interesting. There are times where I'm stressed out, <laughs> and I'm just like. Oh my God, we just have too much shit to do today. Pardon my language, but like we just have too much to do. And uh, you know, maybe we don't have time. <laughs> I rarely do that because it's always a mistake. Mm -hmm. Um, I have learned the few times I have done that, it has completely changed the nature of the class and of mm -hmm. our meeting. And that by not sitting together, by not being together, it has it's really harmed our ability to listen to each other and to work together and to uh, achieve kind of our shared goals for that day. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's really important. I think that the other thing that's really critical to be able to do that kind of work, especially when you're talking about working with people who are different from yourself, mm -hmm. 
in whatever way you define that, right? You could define that as different in all kinds of different ways, right? Um, but to get away from this idea of self and other, uh, the idea that there is an other as opposed to just a collective we mm -hmm. is so critical to be able to be effective in public health, right? Mm -hmm. If you see people- it's The inside of non-self, right? Right, exactly. The inside of non-self and the insight, it's sort of non-self and interbeing. Yeah. Um, it's all those things. And um, and so and so I think that that's hard to teach, but I think through practice and uh, through in the ways that Plum Village teaches that. I think that can be extremely helpful in public health settings because I have found that the people who are most effective in public health, who really make a difference, don't distinguish themselves from others. Mm -hmm. um, not because they have trouble with boundaries or anything like that, <laughs> but because they really see that as, uh, you know, all, all together. And so I think that that's, that's another way of doing it. And then to be more specific around that, because there is so much uh, of this, uh, of harm in from, again, the harm to communities because of isms in our society, mm -hmm. um, this is something that also has been shown through research, you know, that by practicing mindfulness, uh, by practicing, you know, loving kindness meditation or just just uh, other forms of meditation, but the studies have been more with loving kindness meditation. You know, we can actually change people's isms and attachment to those kinds of views mm -hmm. um, and change how people perceive sort of fear and other or uh, you know aversion towards people who are different. Mm -hmm. And so I see those things as really critical to being effective as public health practitioners. Mm. Um, in addition to, uh, so that's sort of creating a, an environment, right? Um, but then I think also adding mindfulness to sort of uh, the list of, of um, things we can do for communities that make a difference. So not just that it be a practice for the practitioners, but also let's add that to really uh, people's basic needs, that people need have a basic need to take care of their um, of their emotional well-being. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of the way we do in education, where we talk about SEL learning, SEL social uh, and uh, mm. emotional learning right. is a key part of K through 12 education. We have to have SEL and that's just like non-negotiable. Mm. Uh, and so why and not? It wasn't always like that. I mean, it wasn't like that when no. I was in high school. Yeah. Certainly wasn't like that for me in the French, you know, French school I went to, which was really more about hitting kids with rulers, but, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but that scene is really critical. Yeah. Uh, because there is an equity issue there if you do, because there are children who if they don't have their needs for SEL um, uh, met they will not be able to learn mm -hmm. um, and I would argue that everyone needs that and so mm -hmm. having that be part of what we're doing and not this sort of extra thing mm -hmm. but having it be incorporated into what it means to not just have absence of disease but well-being, which is the other change, I think, in public health is, you know, not having a heart attack is not a success in public health as far as I'm concerned. It's well-being. Yeah. That's what's really important. Right. Thriving. Learning Thriving. Life. Exactly. There's a, uh, I, I wanted to ask a question and actually Donna Gordon, who's on the call, um, is um, put the question, almost the question I wanted to ask. <laughs> so sure. I'll read her question. Um, she asked, what are the conditions you feel are most impacting youth health at this time? I personally always feel the climate crisis weighs heavily on youth and their ability to maintain positive outlook for their futures. 
I mean, I think climate trauma is enormous. I think it's something that uh, people in my generation really can't appreciate uh, or don't appreciate the way we should. Uh, uh, it's almost a trauma that that I don't claim to be able to appreciate in the same way that I can't say I can appreciate someone else's ism mm. uh, because it's just not affecting me the same way. Um, so I think, you know, there's the larger forces that are harming young people. And then there are the processes through which that harm is, is inflicting pain on young people. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the larger forces uh, in terms of the trauma of, you know, the sort of triple trauma of, of the climate crisis, uh, the pandemic, which has, you know, will have a lasting impact on, on uh, people who uh, were, you know, coming into being uh, during this time. Um, and our crisis of, 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 uh, of inequity and hatred and polarization going on right now in multiple ways through uh, wars, uh, not just in Ukraine, but also in Ethiopia, where uh, half a million people have died. Um, the polarization that we have through through people who are gaining power through hateful speech, um, and the ways in which we've sort of weaponized difference, um, and the ways in which we are, uh, you know, causing harm to people who are different from us, and praising that, and and also the harm of inequity that you talked about earlier. Brother Faplu, I think um, is really important. Um, I know I, so I was a teenager in the late seventies and, uh, and early eighties. And I really thought that we had a long way to go to be equitable. And as it turns out, that is the point in my life where we were the most equitable, mm -hmm. uh, from the time I was born until now. And uh, so the difference between the people who had the most and the least was far narrower than it is now. And uh, and that's something that I try to explain to young people that who I work with, because um, I think it's important for them to know that, you know, it hasn't always been like this. Yeah. Um, so and, and and I think that knowing that things have have been different is really important in order to believe that there can be uh, change. And so that's one of the things I think as I get older, I just turned 60. Um, one of the things I feel that, okay, I need to be sure that I can try to reverse some of the things that I've seen happen in my lifetime, because I'm afraid that people, there won't be anyone left who remembers when it wasn't like that. And then we'll have this sort of complacency. Right. Um, and so, um, so I think really giving people hope through stories and um, is important. I'm really have gone off kilter on this question. I can tell. <laughs> no, no, but I did. I mean, yeah, it's, 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 it's really, really I mean, as I go deeper in my own understanding of public health, I see the impacts on every aspect. Yeah. Our individual lives, our collective lives, political yeah. lives, educational lives. I mean, <laughs> all those things. No, and I think all three of those traumas, the climate, uh, the, the, the trauma of hatred and the trauma of the pandemic all have come together to, to cause crises in people's health, in their physical health, young people's physical health is not uh, what it was before uh, for lots of reasons. Um, and people's mental health is not the way it was before. And I would argue their connectedness health, their the health of them as uh, as a community of young people and as, a, as, as individuals connected to people who are older and younger than them and all that has also been affected. Mm -hmm. uh, and and so I, I think, but I also think that that young people that I'm working with today are far more innovative and far more likely to be change makers. Mm -hmm. I mean, logarithmically more than uh, than people in my generation we were when we were 
their age or for that matter, even people my age right now, just they're just, they're not waiting for permission. And they're just taking the bull by the horns and doing incredible things, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, and really paradigm changing things that are are really uh, impactful. Um, so, so I actually, I don't think I'm, I hope I'm not some, an older person who's passing the buck, but I, I do really trust in young people. Um, I trust the future with them. We should have more questions. I'm sorry. In the time we have. (laughs) No, I think that's, that's okay. This is a very inspiring and I feel like, um, I've learned so much personally and, yeah, and, and felt a deeper commitment to what we can do here at Deer Park to um, contribute to the situation of um, public health here in Escondido in Southern California and then expanding outward. <laughs> I mean, we, we are very kind of keenly aware that a lot of our outreach goes to a very narrow kind of demographic and how, you know, I mean, just even recently just opening up and doing Spanish speaking uh, Spanish-speaking retreat or Spanish-speaking day of we had the Day of the Dead last week. <laughs> you know, it, you know, just things like that would help us to start to expand our reach and and see that you know we we can be really I think what the you know the time of the Buddha um, a vihara or a monastery was considered to be, which is basically the I see I consider it the the beginning of a public park, right, of a, of a place where people can all feel welcome. And they can take refuge. They can take refuge in nature. They can take refuge in even more so in the the practice of healing and transformation. And and that's certainly, I think, the way we see Deer Park. But it's true that there are many ways in which we're we're not quite there yet. So this has been really informative, very fun. (laughs) I hope it's fun for you. Super fun. I (laughs) I I'm I'm all in. I just want you to know. I'm all in to awesome. support that in in a, in a beginner's mind, uh, humble way, uh, <laughs> really, truly, uh, because uh, I, I feel very much a beginner, uh, but insofar as I can bring the knowledge I have in other areas, um, I'd be happy to partner and bring others I know who really care um, into the space with you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Professor Ayoswad Coco. <laughs> and thank you. I think we'll see you soon in a couple of weeks down here, huh? Yes, I'll be there. Um, yeah, I think two weeks from Friday, I think I'll be there. I can't wait. Wonderful. Okay. Well, right. thank you so much on behalf of everyone. And we'll see you soon. Thank, thank you for this opportunity. Hello.